Greetings and welcome to Hockey Wanderlust's 10-Minute Misconduct. I'm Rob Simpson in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. And it is my distinct pleasure today to bring in one of the greats of North American broadcasting. Uh, he was the former backup to Doc Emmerich at NBC Sports for many years, 25 years, the television play-by-play -play man for the Carolina Hurricanes, and now the inaugural voice on television, play-by-play -play man, for the Seattle Kraken. It is none other than John Forsland. <laughs> John, how are you? I'm all right, Simmer. How are you? That's a, quite a buildup. Thanks very much. Oh, you're the man. I don't, deserve, the man. I don't deserve any of that. Come on. Are you kidding me? <laughs> uh, how's life in the Emerald City, first of all? You're drinking coffee. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect segue. Um, yeah. the, the, where, where Starbucks started. But... Um, How's it going so far? Settling in? Yeah, settling in is right. It's it's tremendous. You know, this was uh, very unusual because of the pandemic, right? I'd never been to Seattle in my life and went through the interview process and, and all of that virtually because of the pandemic. And then came here for the first time in July, was out here for both drafts, spent about 10 days here, absolutely glorious conditions. And uh, now I've been here for about two weeks. So getting myself uh, acclimated to a new home. I've uh, been busy every day. The anticipation is growing. I, I can just tell you that the excitement is off the charts for this team here. And uh, I can't wait for Thursday when it gets real. We have a training camp. We actually uh, see the players uh, you know, really focused in and, and kick off the preseason on Sunday. For the fans in Europe, you have got, boy, it, there is quite a presence. Uh, Larson along the blue line, um, up front, you've got Donskoy, you got Jarn Kroak, you got Alexander Wenberg, and of course, you got the German in net. This is uh, a pretty good little melting pot, which is kind of sign signifies the whole trend in the league. That's right. I, I don't think uh, any team anywhere gets off the ground without a strong European presence. Um, the bottom line is these players are trained so well, we could do a far better job in North America looking at some of their practices, including, um, unless I'm wrong, in Sweden, where they actually give a lot of the young hockey players a summer off to, to enjoy other sports. Um, you know, the year round program, many Canadians and Americans are on right now. I'm not a proponent of, I raised a hockey player. I don't think it's good, but there's a reason why, you know, Sweden, Finland, especially with their population, they're such strong hockey countries. It's because of how the players are seasoned on the way up. So you get intelligent players, you get committed players, you get guys who are terrific teammates. And when you look at what the Kraken have assembled here, that's exactly it. You know, they're, they're they come in, they're quiet, they go about their business. Uh, but they make a difference and they make a difference in a lot of the detail work that often gets overlooked. And I think that's what we'll see with some of the names you just mentioned, uh, aside from the goalie, who is always determined by how many pucks go in. That's the easy one, right? But when you get to Adam Larson, who's a minutes eater, who's a, a great athlete, who can, who can very uh, subtly just settle down your defense and anchor your defense, you look at the guys up front, uh, many of those players, Donskoy and Wenberg and Yarncroak, will be in heightened roles with opportunity to dip into their skill set. Wenberg took a big leap with Florida last year. I think he was just down a dead end street in Columbus with Tortorella. It wasn't working. Seemed like he, he lost his confidence. He's a first round pick. That was recaptured last season. He'll build on that. Don Scoy is a scoring touch, is an ability to, to, to put the puck in the net, which will be needed on this team. Again, height and level. And then Yarn Croak is a Swiss army knife. You know, he's not from Switzerland, but he should be because he can just play in a variety of different roles, kill penalties. He can play the middle if he has to, he might have to with this team, but he comes from a program in Nashville, especially when Barry Trotz was there, where you learn how to play one way, right, Simmer, and that's it. And so uh, I think he's a highly intelligent player. Um, with that IQ, you need to be successful. For the fans that are distant, first of all, the Kraken, it's a sea monster. It is. It is a sea monster. It it's, is. If you believe in sea monsters, this, this is true. That's what a Kraken is, K-R-A-K-E-N. Let's face this, John. Are we really going to see a duplication of a, like William Carlson scoring 43 goals and, and having five 20 goal scores and having Shea Theodore break out and and Riley Smith and and Mark Andre Fleury did, doing what he did in 17 18? I mean, come on, do we really think this Kraken lineup can pull something like that off? 
you know, to be fair, you'd say no, right? I mean, you know, you're really wishing for something that might be unrealistic. I will say you bring up Carlson, right? No one saw that one coming. You know, he looked like he was a three center, checking center, you know, coming into that first season and then bang, you know, he gets a big contract and he's, you know, he's a, he's a legitimate two. Um, and, and on a great elite team, he might be a three, you know, moving forward in his career. But th those are the types of stories, Simmer, that you, you have to hope you see. But you have to look at it realistically. And I think if you look at the Kraken roster, what's assembled right now, scoring is a weakness. Center ice play until Gord gets back, Yanni Gord healthy. You know, uh, that's an area that they can hone up on moving forward. But defensively from the goal out, it's not too bad. They have a nice foundation. And with Dave Haxtall at the helm, you know, known for being a systematic coach, a defensive coach, in a new environment, you know, I think he kind of got kicked to the curb in Philadelphia. I'm not sure that was really fair how things went down there. So here he'll be able to put that in place from day number one. Um, that puts this team in a position to, to, to be in games. And I think that's what you want. You don't want to see that disparity that we saw many years ago uh, when expansion teams took at least five years to be real. And they went in there just crossing their fingers and they were just outclassed most, most nights. That's not going to be the case here. The league is different. Uh, the rosters are completely different. The salary cap had much to do about that. So, yeah, I, I, I think realistically, let's just say they're going to be a competitive team. And if you get to that perfect storm in March and April, and I think that's when the fan base kicks in. And that's really what happened in Vegas. I mean, Vegas, to be fair, uh, went through five goalies that first year, uh, but they did have two incredibly long winning streaks, as you recall, yeah. and it became a perfect storm. And that's what you need. And then you have the energy and the emotion. You know, they went from that horrible tragedy at the beginning of that year uh, to writing this unbelievable story with, uh, with many of the players, you know, really just, just cast off to that lineup, right? So um, that's what makes this interesting and hopefully a lot of fun to watch. Yeah, I, I, it's something I've forgotten. You know, it's something you'd like to forget about. And I have brought that up in a story I've written before about the fact the team did gel, really come together around the shooting incident. And obviously that's yeah. something that no team ever wants to have experience right. in again in the history of mankind but that was a factor and it's the wrong kind of thing to have to pull a team together um some amazing history up here in that you just mentioned the expansion and what uh, other teams have gone through of course in 1970 it was the canucks and sabers coming into the league uh, yeah. and there were some lean years and of course seattle was the first american team to win the stanley cup i believe 19 it was in 1918 um yeah. so it, it's crazy some of the history with the hockey have you worked on your puns? So you mentioned if they go in a winning streak or losing streak, they'll be smoking to cracking. Oh, uh, if they get into a line brawl, they'll be cracking to heads. You know, like it's, oh. just, it's endless. <laughs> you right? can put all of those. You you can put all of those in the suggestion box, and uh, <laughs> we'll see we'll see what happens. All right. Now, how long is Gord out? By the way, your your center position is kind of weak anyway, and now Yanni yeah. Gord is how long? Yeah, so I had uh, dinner with Ron Francis last week, yep. and um, we're going to get to camp, and we're going to get more of a definitive word. But to me, it appears a little bit more optimistic than, say, it was in July. So I don't know if the wait's going to be that long. Uh, the sooner the better, obviously. I mean, this guy gets an opportunity to uh, to flourish in this lineup, really, yep. and take it to another level. And that's the beauty of this, a lot of these players can reset their careers. They're going to be in roles and slots that were different than, say, in Gord's case, where he was with that Tampa Bay team in the three hole. You know, here he's in a one, two hole. You know, how does that work out for him? Is it too much? Is it just right? Does he flourish even more? You know, who knows? Time will tell on that. But I think I think there could be some good news on the horizon with him. Anybody else intrigue you on the roster? Like you're kind of like, hmm, I'm really curious what this guy's up to. And, and with that in mind, also the goaltending, I ranked the goalies in the Pacific and, you know, take the team away from it and the backup away from it. I mean, come on, yeah. Philip Grubar. Like this is a, yeah. this is a, if you're working from the goal out, that's a pretty damn good start. Yeah, it was a home run. And I think Francis did a good job right away with three young goalies that he selected, right? Drieger. Chris Drager put himself in a real good spot, pushing Bobrovsky in Florida, getting an opportunity to be maybe a one. So on expansion draft day, 
he is the number one goalie. Then there's Vitek Vanacek, who's an up-and-coming goalie. He got forced in last year, as you know, and did a great job with Washington. But when Grubauer became available, and then they signed Grubauer, I mean, that's the home run of the offseason, really, when you look at it league-wide. So this team's going to need two. Most teams do. But based on their schedule, the amount of travel, um, you're going to have to have two prime goalies ready to go to keep you in games. Then you get to the back end. And I think the back end has a lot of balance, has some g- great leadership with Giordano, Larson, and Alexiak. Uh, you've got some young burgeoning guys like Lausanne and Susie, Hayden Fleury. Um, but on defense, um, I think Vince Dunn's going to be interesting to watch. You know, here's a guy who has always looked for more with St. Louis, could never get there. He's had some injury problems, some slotting problems. He underachieved a little bit, but he has the skating ability and the puck skills. They're going to need him on the power play. You know, one of the two units, you're going to see a lot of Vince Dunn, I would imagine. So, you know, because their their group of defensemen are, are pretty solid, but that offensive guy that you need in today's game, you know, he might be the outlier. He might be the guy that really provides all of that. So I'm looking for him. And then forward wise, uh, it's balanced. Uh, it doesn't, you know, knock your socks off. I think that's impossible in the expansion process. But all four lines have some scoring ability. And I, I think you're right. I think they need to hone up down the middle. That's the true strength of any team. And uh, but I, I think that, that Hackstall's got some interchangeable parts, which will be interesting to watch. Uh, I loved Carson's Susie, by the way, in um, usual mm-hmm. the usual suspects. What a great uh, as the villain, yeah. Carson Susie. Wasn't that the guy's name, Carson Susie? Yeah, Carson Susie. He took a big leap last year with the Wild. Like he he was a shutdown guy, sixth attacker against right. Like him and Ian Cole. They were out there. It wasn't Spurgeon and Suter and and Dumba and, and Brodine. By and large, it, w- it was those two. And uh, yeah, that was a, that was a sleepy pick. I, I like the defensemen they have. I really I really do. Uh, John, just give us uh, last thing here. The the whole vibe, like the, yeah. the the arena. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of it's a green area. You know, I call, we refer to sometimes as the crispy crunchies. And, and the environmental elements and it's similar to Vancouver in a lot of ways that way. Um, I agree, just I the, menta- the mentality of this, the franchise that way and, the, and how they've approached this whole thing. Organically. Okay, so yeah, organically is a good word. So excitement wise, uh, I, I, the only thing I can relate it to, if you can imagine the anticipation before a playoff round in any market, that's what it feels like already. Okay, so the fan events I've been to, we opened up the practice facility. It's eighty million dollar facility. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, it was fantastic. So there's a definite vibe. Uh, there's merchandise everywhere. Everywhere you go in the city, you're going to see a, a crack and ball cap. You're going to see uh, polos and and jackets and so on. It's everywhere. So they've done a really good job with that. The colors are striking. People will debate the name I've seen for and against, but you have to have a catchy name. You have to have a name that, that, that strikes a chord and people remember. I think they hit a home run with that. And then I think when you get to Climate Pledge Arena, Simmer, it is absolutely fantastic. Uh, it, it will be one of the best buildings in the world. The amenities, it's all tricked out. It's absolutely fantastic from top to bottom. I toured it in July. Um, you know, basically still a shell, but I went from the bottom of the building all the way up and got to see the inner workings of what, all the detail work they, they've done downstairs. The visitor's room will be better than most home rooms in the league. The home room is unbelievable. Uh, so everything here is first cabin and then you get to the messaging, right? So the cynics of the world will have everything to say. The political people have everything to say about whatever side of the fence you're on these days. And that's really unfortunate. But when you look at what they're trying to do here, the Kraken are trying to make a difference in the community and really league wide. They've been trendsetters in many ways. Um, uh, the hiring practices, the community presence, the initiatives they've taken on, the, the, the commitment to the climate, which is real. When you come in the building as a fan, you will go down these escalators in this grand hall and there will be LED murals all around you telling you about Climate Pledge and what it's all about. So they, they stand behind it. 
And, um, you know, I use a hashtag on my Twitter account, that's Kraken Hockey. And, and that encompasses everything they do. And it sounds really idealistic right now and all this, all this uh, kind of thing. But for me, who's going, this will be my 30th year in the NHL. Um, this is very refreshing to be a part of this. And I feel privileged to get this opportunity to kind of mark time at this stage of my career uh, with a team. So uh, for what they stand for. I'm, I'm proud to say I'm a member of this organization, great people here. So that's a synopsis. That's what it's all about. And then we'll finally get to uh, wins and losses. And that will determine most people's attitudes moving forward. But at least this is a good start. Very, very good. Um, yeah, you need idea. People need to have ideals. To, that's where, that's yeah. the starting point. You're going to build off that. That's right. And that's right. 30 years, John, you look great. Spring chicken. <laughs> what are you kidding me? 30 years. Yeah. Yeah, 30 years. I was years. laughing that I got a Imagine. I got paid 10 bucks under the table to cover my first NHL game, in, uh, Detroit Red Wings, Vancouver Canucks. That was in 1981, John, 40 years ago as a teenager. I, I got paid under the table six of my seven years in the American League. <laughs> really? Yeah, 84 to 84 to 91, something don't like tell, that. Don't tell the IRS if they there's a there's a blank uh, there's a blank thing on my on my record there. It wasn't <laughs> it wasn't around. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, it, it's always a distinct pleasure having a chat with you and then run into you at rinks, which hopefully we'll be doing in the next few days. And uh, we appreciate your time and uh, wish you the very best. Well, from the, the fans around here, by the way, this is Gordy Howe. You might have heard of him. He did yeah. actually, he was one of the co-founding owners of the Vancouver Giants WHL team. Uh, but I keep him around because he's still my hero. Um, Should keep but the around. fans around here will not be pulling for you. I'll be, I'll be pulling for you of course, personally, John, but thank you very much for your time and, and we'll see you at the rink. Thank you, Simmer. My pleasure. All the best to you, buddy. Take care.